In this lecture, we'll review the historical and aesthetic context of Victorian literature in preparation for our readings of Sir Alfred Lord Tennyson and Robert Browning. When people think of the Victorians, they tend to think of uptight, darkly dressed, tightly corseted, pinky finger in the air prudes, and in some senses this is true. When we think of the Romantics, we might think of really introspective poetic types wandering the countryside. This is because Britain was largely rural and relatively sparsely populated in the early 19th century. Cultural concerns were more personal, spiritual, and psychological, and so the Romantics also relied heavily on poetry as the medium that lends itself best to these kinds of internal subjects. But as we can see on the timeline, over the course of the 19th century, Britain entered an era of modernity. We have the development of rapid transportation, the development of industrial production, the elevation of materialism, the rise of the middle class, the rise of general education, the mass dissemination of information, and so forth. The readership became not only ready, but intellectually and financially willing to participate in a literary market, and what they wanted to read about changed with the face of Britain. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were 11 million people in Britain, and 75% of them lived in rural towns and villages. In contrast, by the end of the century, there were 37 million people in Britain, and 75% of them lived in large industrial cities. All this is to say that as time wore on, poetry seemed less and less able to address the mass-produced and institutionalized life of industrial capitalist society. That is, poetry won't completely disappear, as we'll see quite a few of our readings this week are poems, but whereas Romanticism is known for its poetry, the Victorian period is known for its prose, especially its novels, and it's because the concerns of culture at that time on material goods and thus public, social, and discursive rather than private matters lent themselves more readily to prose. Indeed, we can even trace a lull in production in novels between the 20s and 30s when novels by those like Jane Austen and Walter Scott, romantics who set their works in the countryside, began to be replaced by those like Charles Dickens, a Victorian and man of the city. At this time, being an author also became a middle-class profession. Writers can now earn a living without depending on other sources of income or even on the system of aristocratic patronage that operated in the 1700s. While some professional Victorian writers lived in poverty, the majority did not, and their incomes instead depended on their popularity. The careers of these writers were made possible by technological innovations, the serialization of fiction in cheap weekly and monthly periodicals that lowered publishing costs. The focus on prose doesn't mean Victorians were no longer interested in the mind, as writers had been with romantic poetry. One of the novels we're looking at this week, Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is in many ways a study of psychology, and this is what distinguishes novels. They situate a sustained intimacy with another consciousness within social contexts, allowing us to cross the boundaries of appearance in order to reveal the inner workings of society and contemplate larger ideas through the characters. In some ways, the trend towards prose reflects the growing alienation between the public and private zeitgeist of Victorian society. London becomes the largest city in the world by 1830, and it is this rapid growth that led to a growing dissonance in thought regarding how people should behave in public in front of others in society, and how they should behave in private in the sanctuary of one's home. Earth-shattering developments and scandals such as the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, which outlined a modern theory on evolution in the 50s, and the Jack the Ripper murders in the 80s made people question whether the composed faces they saw flitting by on the streets of London were really just masks for the brute monsters within. We see this tension and anxiety between self and society in Stevenson's novel as well as in our dramatic monologues or poems for the week. A dramatic monologue is a type of poem that became popular in the 19th century. As an outgrowth of the autobiographical trend of the 18th century, the dramatic monologue is typified by a persona, or first-person character that the author adopts and speaks through. The persona is considered a mask of the poet, just as one might wear a mask on a stage. But just like any actor, the mask an author wears is not necessarily representative of who the author is and or his or her experiences. This was a particularly important feature for writers like Robert Browning, who was actually a very private person in real life, and so it was important for him that his characters be kept distinct from his own reputation. Keep in mind that in the previous century, the moral fiber of one's characters were often understood to be indicative of one's own moral stuff. So in dramatic monologues, there is a persona speaking in a certain place and a certain time. It is important for readers to determine when and where the persona is speaking to help complete the picture of who the persona is and why the persona is speaking on the subject that he or she is speaking. When you're reading dramatic monologues, it's generally a good idea to ask the basic journalist questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, to set the scene. 
Along these lines, there is typically an auditor to the persona's speech as well. That is, the persona may be speaking to someone or a group of someones. And unlike the conversational poems of romanticism, this auditor may respond, but we can only know what he or she says and does through clues given to us from the persona's perspective. This is key. All our information comes through the persona's speech. And this leads us to the third basic quality of dramatic monologues. They reveal something about the persona to the reader. Since all our information comes from the persona him or herself, readers must sift through the persona's usually extreme biases and metaphorical blind spots in order to draw a conclusion, usually of surprising import, about the speaker. The practice of drawing these conclusions about the persona allows readers to undertake their own moral exercise, and sometimes a definitive conclusion is purposefully evaded by the author in the poem in order to support this moral endeavor. This is the quality of uncertainty that Browning in particular sought to imbue in his poems. Beyond the public versus private theme supported by our dramatic monologues, we'll see other common themes in many of our Victorian texts as well. One major motif is that of the poet-historian. We've already talked about antiquarianism a bit during our week on Gothicism. Antiquarianism focuses on an appreciation of the past, and Victorians were fascinated with the past, be it medieval or classical, as it fed their sense of a cultural heritage as one that was once savage, but now is learned. This antiquarian impulse through its historical bent also gave access to an authentic or pure English identity, which in the face of the century's many changes was a comfort and retreat for many. The poet-historian is a motif that's in contrast to the growing field of speculative fiction at this time, or fiction that asks what-if questions and encompasses both the genres of fantasy and science fiction. For instance, a text that asks what if the forces of good and evil could be controlled by extra-sensitive individuals would be fantasy. A text that asks, in contrast, what if deep space travel were possible would be sci-fi. Whereas a poet-historian may look backwards to inquire into Victorian cultural anxieties as well as provide a hopeful vision for the future despite the political, social, intellectual, and spiritual upheaval of the century, speculative fiction looks forward to the future to explore the consequences of Victorian values and developments. We'll see antiquarianism in Tennyson and Browning, as well as speculation in Stevenson. Now, we'll be covering three authors this week. The presenters will introduce Stevenson, so we'll introduce Browning and Tennyson briefly here. Before Browning became famous in the 1860s, he was generally referred to as Mrs. Browning's husband, which is kind of an unusual way for a man at this time to be called, and allows us to understand his eagerness to be recognized as an author. Yet Browning was also a private man. Once when John Stuart Mill, a philosopher and economist, happened to remark upon one of Browning's earlier confessional pieces, saying that Browning had been afflicted by a, quote, intense and morbid self-consciousness, end quote, Browning swore off confessional writings altogether. The dramatic monologue, then, is a safety valve that allows Browning to produce an autobiographical voice without necessarily implicating himself. Tennyson grew up in an impoverished and dysfunctional family of 12 children. One of his brothers was committed to an insane asylum, another became addicted to opium, and his father was an alcoholic. Yet by the time he was in his 40s, he became one of the most popular poets of his time and was made poet laureate. Fun fact, he held this position the longest of any poet before or after him for 42 years, and we can certainly expect his position as poet laureate to have affected his text as he needed to provide his readership with unifying hope in England's future.